White Centipede Noise podcast is made possible by your support via Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash white centipede noise to support and stay tuned until the end of this episode to hear about the exclusive benefits and bonus content available with this episode. Podcast. I'm Oscar Brummel, and today my guest is James Light of the infamous power electronic duo Agonal Lust, the cult label Finders, solo products such as Meat Packer, and much more. Hey, James, welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. Oscar, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. <laughs> really appreciate you taking the time with me this morning. Um, you are up to a lot of things in the noise power electronics industrial underground for quite some time um when i first became aware of your activities it was through your label finders can you tell me what you know which was a very unique and and i I would say important label at the time which is now deceased i take it but um it it had a big impact in a lot of ways i think what can you tell me about the birth of finders what motivated you to start that label and what the kind of starting philosophy and mindset towards the label was? All right. Yeah. Uh, well, so at the birth of Finders, I have been inactive from visual art, making music and supporting music for, whew, you know, probably going on 15 years, 10, 15 years. Um, And I wanted to get back involved. Um, I wanted to start making my own music again, as well as supporting uh, friends with like-minded visions um, who I appreciated their dedication. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was sort of how, you know, Finders came to fruition. Um, I never really expected it to be what it, was um you know i did it keith brewer did most of the promotion for it Mm. um he handled all the message boards and all that for me because i really i I don't much care for posting or or talking on message boards generally Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um shortly after finders was created i started recording as mp um, and then I subsequently released my first um, limited tape, you know, through Finders, just just to do it. Um, and I released, I think, a total of three versions of that. Mm-hmm. Um, throughout Finders, I worked with different people with different visions and um, different extremities, you know, uh, you know, from Kafor to uh, Swallowing Bile to interracial sex, all these people with very different ideals, but very extreme. Um, Mm -hmm. I didn't want censorship to ever play a role in it. You know, Mm -hmm. with the Wonderland Club Club release, um, you know, censorship was not an issue. I I was not going to censor anything. Um, And then I just did the art that came to mind with it and uh, push forward as long as I could. Um, you know, at Finders, I eventually felt like I had hit a wall. Mm-hmm. I wanted to create something more personal. Um, you know, not to say that Finders wasn't personal, but I felt that there was something more for me to do. Yeah. It did seem back. like, it did seem like, you know, it was like a small, kind of like circle of artists it seemed like like kind of like a family kind of thing it felt like you you know those are artists who were probably pretty close with, on some level were were those people you kind of had a relationship before going into releases or was it oftentimes you approached them about a release and that was kind of like the first 
contact? Um, so I started the label with one main primary contact for that group of people. And then um, I made more acquaintances. I made more friends, you know, uh, staying together for maps in Queens mm-hmm. was a big change. Um, you know, I put myself back out there. I, I spent a long time alone. So it's not like I knew all of these people very personally. Yeah. Um, but we all clicked very well. And uh, most of us are still in contact. Yeah. That's cool. Um, what was it? I mean, you kind of ex- you kind of expressed the 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 fascination with their extremity and their vision. But what was it about certain artists? How did you choose which artists you really wanted to work with? Because there weren't so many releases. They're pretty specific, and I think it was a. I mean, for the time that it was active, it was a very sought after, exciting label for people. So I mean, I think for the people that you chose, it was kind of a significant thing. Like you weren't just cranking out tons of stuff. No, and um, I still don't really ever focus on cranking out tons of stuff, and I still work with a close, close knit circle. Um, at the time, it was that they were all different. They all had these extremes, you know. Bufar had his extreme, you know. Mac had this mm-hmm. ultimate vision that was really quite extreme, you know. Swallowing bile, uh, Ethan Ebeling. Um, you know, however you take him now or then is, you know, solely up to you. But he had this vision. It was extreme and it was different than Max extreme. Mm-hmm. And then interracial sex. I mean, at the time, before he released Boy, it seemed like his extreme was just everywhere. He mm-hmm. wanted you to feel uncomfortable isn't the word he wanted you to leave feeling something just dirty almost Mm -hmm. i I think that followed through with boy but boy was so well composed compared to some other work that um it it grasped a much wider audience Mm -hmm. sure yeah for sure um you mentioned that you were kind of out of music and art for quite a while and and you said you mentioned visual art too and finders has a very distinct visual style and it's you know kind of a nod to the classic rough xerox style but it's executed and designed very kind of specifically and stylistically and i think printed and pulled off in a very nuanced nuanced way do you have a you have a background in in visual art or, or history with visual art um no, not um, in an academic manner. Um, I started, geez, I started building computers and programming and doing graphic design when I was 13 years old. Hmm. Um, it really took off around 1999 for me. And that's when I also suddenly, I, I don't know what I, I didn't find anything, you know, I, I didn't have a background in experimental music but I found myself making it not knowing what it was, you know, and then my exposures would eventually become things like Autechre, Square Mm -hmm. Pusher, Apex Twin. I mean, Apex Twin, obviously, in the much earlier 90s with their success of MTV. Um, Mm -hmm. As far as industrial goes, I, you know, I had known about Coil since the early 90s, as well as Nine Inch Nails, and obviously together. Um, Yeah. And I don't really consider myself to be a, a maker of, of noise per se, oftentimes, though I do partake. Um, I am really much more of, a, you know, a avant-garde, music concrete, industrial, and mm-hmm. uh, that kind of thing. Attention. Nuclear War Now and Hospital Productions Fest Volume 1 is happening April 6th and 7th, 2024 in Osaka, Japan, featuring Genocide Organ, Masana, Beherit, Blasphemy, Departure Chandelier, and many more yet to be announced. This event is selling fast, so get your tickets now at hospitalproductions.net or the link in the description of this episode. And keep your eye out on the appropriate channels for further lineup announcements. Going back to Finders a little bit, with the with the label kind of aura around it and the way it was promoted, and it was it was very hard to get, and it was, you know, limited, 
hard to get, hard to know about where to get it. Um, can you tell about about your philosophy with that? I mean, was that an intentional decision to 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 have it be like that? It was not. Um, so I started Finders really with the idea that who really cares? Uh, who am I? Who are these people? You know, they, they deserve attention, um, whether my art did or not. Uh, debatable, but um, I wasn't sure how to approach it. So on the first Finders update, I uh, Keith Brewer had posted about it, which off obviously gave it this grasp, you know, Keith. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the additions were really, I think, uh, no higher than 80. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the lowest being you know, 50. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I usually make agreements with people who I think, um, are diehards and regularly interested that I will, um, you know, I'll sell to them privately beforehand. Mm-hmm. And by the time those tapes went up for sale, they were, I mean, they were sold. They were, they were yeah. going to go. They were just, yeah. didn't really matter. Yeah. How did you, how did you or how do you feel about people like either intentionally flipping them or kind of speculating on them or you know they they go for high prices now I mean those ones those early ones I was just looking a moment ago and you know some of them were like up there for 150 bucks and stuff like that and I'm sure that was happening at the time that people were you know trying to grab that too so hopefully not that many people were doing that because you know you, I think it's cool you said you you sold it to people kind of privately beforehand I think that's respectable. But then I'm sure that there were the people that were waiting for that public drop that, so they could, you know, get them yeah. and kind of get a piece of it and maybe sell it, maybe not. But, I mean, how do you feel about that? Um, well, as far as flipping goes, I I stand pretty adamantly against, you know, hardcore flipping, um, repeated offenders. I certainly understand someone trying to get rid of their collection to collect money to serve a purpose mm-hmm. in their life and they know that this sells more you know that that's a little different but yeah you know if i ship out copies and then a week later there's a discogs copy for 80 bucks yeah um i look to see who it is and i usually find out who it is and um i've refused sale to those people before in the past mm-hmm. um I really flipping for high cost for something that is relatively new, even if limited, I just don't, I can't get behind supporting that. I I understand that there's a demand, but if those people who are like, look, I'm going to spend $160 or maybe you can help me contacted me. Um, Chances are I'd find some way to oblige them. I'm sure. not always very fast, but yeah. I do stand true. Yeah, cool. Um, how do you feel about people uploading the stuff? Because, I mean, that's something I'm always back and forth with. And I kind of earlier was annoyed when I'd see people uploading stuff to YouTube or something like that. You know, there's a, there's a couple, like, pretty prominent YouTube channels at this point. And for a while, yeah. they really annoyed me, but... In, re- in retrospect, I've kind of sort of seemed like, okay, they're kind of a, maybe an important player in the in the game. I mean, how do you feel about that when you see someone upload, say, one of your tapes or some of your music? So, originally, I was pretty adamantly against digital release. Um, it just didn't seem to fit in with the culture. But at the same time, I think I was I was forgetting that cultures change over time you know youtube didn't exist in 1980 or 1992 it it wasn't there um yeah there is one uh person in particular who tends to upload a lot of my releases whether they be my personal or labels releases onto uh youtube Mm -hmm. and um i've decided that there's really no harm um if it allows it to reach a wider audience that generally wouldn't buy physical releases, I get that. Not everyone wants the clutter 
all of that, but they they still want to hear it. They they still like it. Well, not everyone. Not everyone can have the clutter. I mean, like like with finders, for example. I mean, there were people clamoring to get it, and it was always like, oh shit, I, you know, people were, in, in some ways, maybe it drives down the the flipping market. I don't know. I mean, I would, you know, I'd actually, I'd hope so, but you know, I was uh, I was going over some prices not too long ago to see what people were asking, and I I, I think I saw one tape for one hundred and sixty dollars. Um, that's not. No one should pay that. Yeah. No, <laughs> I should have put a label on the release just to make it even better. Like, do not buy this for more than twenty dollars or something. You know, right, something right, right. That costs the flipper a little room, but yeah. Um, you know, I didn't. I didn't do that. Um, and even if I had, would it have really worked? I don't know. I'm not the crass. Um, sure. But, but I. Uh, I don't like to see that at all, but that release will never be re-released. I will never, I'm not going to go backwards without, I'm not going back to finders. Um, if anything ever does happen with finders again, I couldn't even begin to speculate what it would be. Yeah. And you're not open to reissuing stuff. No, not at the moment for finders. I left it and, uh, it's going to remain there. Um, for packing plant, there are releases in the talks of being reissued on vinyl LP, and mm-hmm. and there are more packing plant releases coming out. Mm-hmm. This is a general question, but kind of something I'm always interested in trying to ask people about and think about is what is your, what do you feel is like your motivation for releasing music whatsoever? Like, what? Why do we do this? For releasing music. I mean, releasing underground music, like, you know, why why do we spend the time making tapes, cutting them out, releasing them? What is the motivation behind that? What do we get from that? That's a very difficult question. And um, I'm sure it, it differs very much so between um, person to person. Um, of course. For me... But like you, yeah. Um... As far as, you know, let's start from the beginning. Um, I'm sitting on my sofa and I'm hearing sounds. I'm hearing I'm hearing things that, no, they aren't there. I'm not hitting any keys. I'm not hitting any switches or making any feedback. Um, but I'm hearing them and I'm saying, oh, that sounds massive. Sounds truly massive. It sounds like something I'm feeling or something I'm dealing with. Um, it sounds almost like a fetish. Um, so I move forward and I uh, I break out some stuff that I think will help me achieve what I want. Um, a synthesizer. Um, several pedals, you know, who knows, whatever mm-hmm. I set up. Mm-hmm. No. And I start exploring th- this initial idea. I, the bastard child, it, it, it changes, it evolves. I, I might hit a key and, whoa, I didn't, I didn't hear that before. Mm-hmm. That's what I want now. I want this. I want, I'm going this way. Mm-hmm. I compile it. Usually, uh, I can afford to record one track a day in anywhere from three to six hours. Um, And once it's all put together and I can hear it, I I get visions of artwork and packaging and things I I just want to do. I I grew up in DIY and I grew up in the hardcore scene. I grew up in the uh, weirdo scene in Onlyville in the late mm-hmm. 90s or 2000s with like Lightning Bolt and stuff like that. Yeah. I just want to make something cohesive that explains or 
maybe even sometimes the art obscures the message of what I'm mm-hmm. trying to do. Um, it pulls me in. I can't stop. I mean, I, I've i tried to stop. I was going to stop. I was going to quit m- making music. And uh, it's just a part of me. It yeah. Just, uh, There's, there's no catharsis ever. There is mm-hmm. no end to this. Um, a, a catharsis, uh, if I had a catharsis when I recorded tomorrow, when I woke up, there may not be a reason anymore. Yeah. But um, if there's no catharsis and there's no end, what what is it? What does it achieve for you? Are you do you feel like you're getting close to a catharsis? Do you, are you achieving? Are you are you processing something? Are you dealing with something effectively? I am dealing with things effectively. Um, effectively or not, maybe not effectively, but do you feel like it's having some sort of give and take effect on you know you're feeling a certain way and then you create something and you get something back from that creation? Absolutely. Um, you know, there's been times where I've sat down and I've recorded for six to eight hours and put away all my equipment disappointed with nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I achieve something, there's definitely a feeling of achievement. Um, but, you know, I only I don't make things that I hear or influenced by other artists. I, I make things that I want to hear. If I can't listen to it uh, six months from now, it was no good in the first place. So, MP was your first project on Finders. Um, And I also really know, you know, the project that really kind of caught my attention was Agonal Lust. And that's a duo with you and the fellow that I knew previously from coma detox yes can you talk about that project and how that works and what your relationship is with with mr coma detox uh, mr coma detox <laughs> aka ds aka ronald elster no real names ever given um is my best friend um one of two i have two best friends and he is one of them. Um, we were introduced by Keith Brewer. Mm-hmm. Um, I released a Discussing Sanctum tape on Finders, and then I contacted Keith for additional collaboration after Ross Cut. And he recommended, you know, I'll work on this, but uh, you should see what he wants to do. Mm-hmm. I uh, sent to him, and uh, that was the beginning of Agonal Lost. Two tracks with no plan to ever release anything else. And um, all of a sudden, we're uh, repeatedly releasing. Um, Agonal Lost is a surrealistic nightmare. It is not power electronics in the way that you know it, even when presented as such. Um, The sounds are not usual or normal. The patterns are not standard. Um, It's a combination of our experiences, whether it be verbatim or not. Um, And maybe fetishes or desires, various different things, Um, but always culminating from both of us coming from a a very difficult background in life. Mm -hmm. Um, Coma Detox is a bit older than I am. Um, He is in his mid forties. I am in my late thirties. He grew up 
having his father taking him from trap house to trap house to get uh, heroin in the Bronx. And uh, I grew up with my father, who is a heroin addict, uh, selling and buying heroin at the docks and various other places. Wow. So our, our relationship is very deep seated. Is that something you guys identified pretty early on this kind of common history of, you know, childhood trauma? Um, or did that come about later? I think we had a pretty good idea early on. Um, but our, our interactions as time progressed became more personal and more intense often with some of the subject matter. Um, but agonal loss, I think, is often misinterpreted as this trope of uh, violent American power electronics. Mm -hmm. But it's not what it is. It's self-hatred overpouring so much that we lose control. Um, and from show to show, we never knew what was going to happen or what would happen. We didn't have specific plans, but maybe sometimes thoughts or something like that, sketches. Mm -hmm. But um, The performances are, I mean, I've never seen you in person, but I mean, I've seen videos and heard stories about you guys performing. It's very, very intense and... It is violent. I mean, maybe not outwardly violent, but it's, you're very violent towards yourselves. You, you specifically, you know, frequently, you know, harming yourself. Yes. Uh, in, in the past, uh, you know, we've only played two shows: uh, Chicago mm -hmm. and then Brooklyn. Um, Brooklyn was probably the the climax of that violence towards myself. Um. And we have talks of coming back one last time, um, at least in America. And uh, we're not sure what shape it's going to take, but we've sort of said that there's not going to be any violence towards the audience. But uh, it's hard to say. We never know mm -hmm. until we get there. Yeah. How does that feel to share such a intimate and you know destructive event with an audience? Man, so different. Um, Chicago, the crowd almost embraced it. They uh, they loved it. They uh, we they had fun, even if they were getting hurt. Um, People were catcalling and yelling out. In New York, people seemed very uncomfortable. There were people uh, fleeing the venue. Um, I didn't plan on what was going to happen, but to be truthful, at the end of the show, um, I was very happy with the result. Mm-hmm. I'm happy we got shut down. We had a half an hour plus set planned. We played for 13 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I got what I wanted out of it. Did that feel better than people embracing it? Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Geez, that's a hard question. I think they still embraced it. I yeah. just think they're terrified. Yeah. Not all but, of them, though. But funny stuck around. Yeah. But seeing people seeing people being genuinely uncomfortable and, and, and troubled by it, was that also, like, fulfilling? Or satisfying in some way? Yes. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, it wasn't my goal going into it, but once I saw that people were worried, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. It allowed me more room to play around. It gave me more imagination. You know, just freaking out and no one giving a fuck. I mean, you don't really have much of an imagination to work with. You're just mm-hmm. doing two. Is that something you reserve for performances, or is that something you kind of have dealt with in your personal life throughout? Um, what are you speaking of? I, I mean, maybe specifically self harm, or just the general. I mean, I mean, just that general energy, and you know, is that a um. I've struggled throughout my life with um, lots of things. Um, Self-harm is one. Um, Violence towards others has been a second. Although, um, at my age now, I'm much calmer than I once was. I uh, take responsibility for myself. I, I have lots of things in my life going on that really require me to keep myself in check. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I I have a history of mental illness and uh, Mm -hmm. self-harm and hospitalizations. Um, Mm -hmm. One of them I showed at the Chicago show. It may have been wrapped up at the time. Um, I believe in gauze, but that would be this. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was... um, suicide attempt several years ago um, i was found i will say it was selfish uh, probably one of the most selfish things i've done in my life uh, especially at that time period um and i recommend anyone feeling that kind of uh pain um confusion or whatever have you uh, that you seek help uh before you get to that mode once you yeah. enter that mode, you you no longer, it's not you. And what yeah. you do, you may not be proud of after, but seek help now. Yeah. Well, happy that you've made it through that and that you're, you know, seemingly quite strong and present now in life. I mean, it's good to see that you're really active as an artist and, you know, as an individual outside of that. And um, what, what role does you've said it wasn't, it isn't quite power electronics, but, but art or music in general, what role does that play in, you know, in relation to your, to your mental health? Does that help? Does that help with it? Does that exacerbate things? Does that, how do those feed off each other? Um, To be honest with you, and this is why, um, over the past couple of years, I've considered walking away. Is um, the, this culture and this recording and the style of things I do and the subjects I cover often um, exacerbate? Mm. Not necessarily a suicidal ideology or mode, mm-hmm. but they exacerbate this pain um what i write about i I don't i don't do political i don't do um soundscapes for the sake of a soundscape Uh, i i make pain specifically mine and Mm -hmm. it it definitely exacerbates In the in the years where you said you weren't really making music, how was your how was your mental health in that time? Well, so I started me- making music in 1999, like regularly. I was homeless by 2002. 
uh, maybe 2001, beginning of two, late 2001, early 2002. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was homeless until I was in my 20s. Mm-hmm. Um, very little opportunity for me to make music. I made music with um, a friend of mine who I lived with briefly on a sofa and a member of the No Neck Blues Band mm. when I was 15 years old. Um, we played live. Um various things but that, that lull overall i mean I, every once in a while i get to pick something up and try to do something you know i collaborated with um felix this, this gentleman felix he did a project mm-hmm. called murmur which is a black metal sort of coalesced project from france mm-hmm. okay um he was in another band uh lesser known mm-hmm. um but rarely Barely anything during that time, and it, it was really mostly just due to homelessness and depression and trying to get it all together. Yeah, um, father and my mother were both drug addicts. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I think that I think that's really honest and interesting what you say about the exacerbation of things through you know art in some way art can be very dangerous you know art can be really really quite dangerous for the human psyche i mean it's it's the most potent thing but it can really put us and allow us to do and dwell on and and revel in very negative and hurt harmful things for us as individuals what do you see yourself potentially doing but you know i also also assume it's very meaningful to you and you know brings a lot to your life in some way i mean what what could you see yourself really walking away from creating music from industrial culture from you know that whole that whole world most likely not um you know there were times where i really thought i might need to just let it go walk away disappear but um i really don't see myself doing it i uh you know, I set up my gear and I start programming and playing keys and finding radio frequencies and doing this and that. You know, I I don't see it happening. And I remember how much fun it was when I got my first Circuit Electronics uh, SMB. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, Sean Royal was always very big on. He's not going to give you instructions you're going to learn to play this how it suits mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. And um, that was fun. Yeah. I, I, I had fun doing that. I, it wasn't all pain. It was, a, it was a process. It was always a process. And, and even mm-hmm. when the process is painful, it doesn't mean you're not having a good time. You just have to be able to separate all the emotions that you're feeling. Yeah. Do you feel do you feel understood or supported by by your peers or say fans or like colleagues in terms of you know music like when you have when you're performing like say in Chicago and people are you know catcalling and getting into what you're doing and you're doing something that's very harmful for yourself and you're exercising something very deep and painful and you see people around you you know cheering it on does that does, does that f- feel good? Do you ever feel like a conflict of being misunderstood by that? Um, yeah, there's a conflict. Definitely um, live in general. People are there to have a good time. Um, I didn't show up to have a good time. I'm not there to make you happy. I'm not there to give you what you want or mm-hmm. what you expect. Um, I can appreciate them hoping for something, sure, but uh, it's not not at all what is going to happen. Um, but in terms of people, in terms of people being su- kind of, I don't want to use a term like empathy, but being empathetic to actually what you're going through versus kind of like maybe just thinking, oh, cool, like 
Do you feel any? Do you feel any of that, or do you wish for any of that? They aren't empathetic, and they don't know. I, I feel that most people that, you know, obviously I've, I've really only been going out with diagonal lust over the past few years and very little. Um, they don't understand what we are writing about, what we are doing, what we are portraying. They're not combining the idea of what we show them in artwork with the lyrics and the sounds. And they don't, they don't put it all together oftentimes. I'm not saying not everybody does. I'm sure many people can, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when we go live and I hear cat calls, or, you know, it, it's not, I'm not, you yell at me. I'm not going to run out there and start pushing people around or doing anything like that. That's not, I'm not pushing. If I attack somebody or if something happens to me, it's not because of the crowd. It's because of my overpouring of self-hatred and intensity while we're playing. It has nothing mm-hmm. to do with the crowd whatsoever. Uh, who you are, what you've yelled rarely matters. Um, I think in New York was the closest it's really come to where someone threw something on stage and I went out and I just, you know, I went for them. Why? Mm-hmm. Because lots of reasons not to throw things back onto the stage that are heavy. Other people's equipment, things like that. I just wasn't happy with it. So can you tell me about some of the other projects that you do or have done? Um, you've, you've got a lot of different monikers and they, you know, even like, you know, MP Meatpacker and, you know, Driller is also you, correct? Driller is me, yes. And there was like a collab tape on Finders, which was MP and Driller, which I think is really cool. Like, that's a really great way to present something. Can you can you talk about, um, you know, like what Meatpacker is exactly versus um, Driller versus uh, some of your, you know, Wounded Son? Okay. Yeah, um... So MP was my first journey back into making avant-garde, industrial, power electronics um, in a very long time. You know, we're probably looking at 10 to 12 years here. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, when I started recording this stuff, I was using Sonic Foundry Acid Pro and a realistic keyboard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I came back and I did that MP and driller. I did it under two monikers on purpose. Um, I just, at the time, I really didn't want people bothering me or knowing who I was. So I chose to do one release under two names um, with two different styles. Mm -hmm. Uh, MP was synthesizer based. All synth, um, mostly mono synth, and then Driller was multiple cassette players. Uh, you know, uh, Library of Congress, uh, tape players for the blind, um, mm-hmm. stuff like that, and re- mixes of recordings from my work uh, in the mine yeah. and um, outside in the you know, the wild, uh, just, uh, you know, um, atmospheric stuff. And I would flip sides rapidly to create sort of these cassette tape cut-ups. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I think that release was very much me still just exploring a multitude of new sounds after mm-hmm. so long active. Um, following that, my next my next release would have been with Agonal Lust, um, and that was just on a whim how it started, sort of coming up with these John Carpenter esque type sounds, yeah, um, mixed with abrasive noise, and, yeah, uh, metal, and. I think uh, the next would have been Meat Packer on uh, Endangered Species. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was when I totally 
sort of came out with this rhythmic sound mm -hmm. um, using drum machines and mono synth. I recorded everything live, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the drum machine to the keys. I hit play and then I just went. Um, the vocals cool. were the only part added secondary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just because in the in the residence I was living in, I didn't think it would work well. Mm -hmm. um, continue on with these solo projects. Uh, right after, right after, after um, the Endangered Species release, I did the Pack and Plant um, an Empty Vessel. That was more beat oriented with a couple sort of heavy electronics type type of vibes on it. Um, mm -hmm. Then then there was uh, Meat Packer Always Sick on OMM from Chile, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is all big loops of junk metal, mm -hmm. uh, feedback and vocals. Everything's mm -hmm. tape except for on the very last yeah. track. Yeah. It's all tape loops. Um, and then there are the Cryptophagia records. Yeah. Which um, are some of my most, um, probably some of my most favorite recordings I've done. Cryptophagia was a duo. It was uh, me and Katja. Um, she is a former partner of mine um, from mm -hmm. Russia. Um, I really have no comment on that. Uh, but um, we worked very well together and came up with sounds that suited each other very well. She did a lot of radio work while I did a lot of work and all that. And I, uh, I pieced together um, the mar majority of the compositions. I did the engineering and the, mm -hmm. the programming, et cetera. Is there any potential for future cryptophagia recordings or releases? Um, I would say at this moment in time, most likely not. Um, there will be a cryptophagia re-release of uh, to carry a name is to bear a burden. That'll come out on LP probably through Cloister. Cool. And then uh, is a great job. Yeah. And then I'm working on um, a new uh, 12 inch LP for hospital for mm. wounded son. And then um, another potential uh, four cassette box set. Cool. For which project? Wounded Sun. Oh, great. Wounded Sun is what I'm heavily focusing on now. Um, I do have one other project called The Sun, um, released by Total Black. And um, that's mostly dark ambient, industrial sounding. Um, mm -hmm. I, I hate to call on influences for sounds or anything like that, but I would say, you know, um, Coil and Nurse of Wound and things like that certainly played a, a respect mm -hmm. in that. Cool. You you said you work in the mines and the driller is kind of a project related to that. How long have you worked in mines and what can you tell me about that? Because it's a pretty, I mean, not unusual job. A lot of people do it, but it's a pretty unusual job for, I guess, someone who do, does what you do as an artist and stuff like that. And I think that's a, can you give me a little insight into that profession and that, that job? Yeah. So, uh, I've worked in an underground mine for eight years. Um, I am by trade and by bid because I'm a, a union worker. I'm United mm -hmm. Steelworkers union. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a drill operator. I operate a, a very large machine that oh. trams sideways. And on it, there are two booms like this with steels with drill bits on them. And you put one at the face, put one at the face, insert drill in your holes wow. as you go out. Um, I've also done uh, a series of other jobs there. Um, I've run LHD, which is a loader. 
Um, very large piece of equipment, the large bucket on the front, use it to scoop salt, which is what we call mucking, mm-hmm. and then drive it back to the feeder, which is something, it's a conveyor that crushes salt and then feeds mm-hmm. it onto a belt that leads to a processing gallery. Wow. Is it salt uh, that you're mining? I mine salt, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, a quarter of a mile underground. Um, there's no natural light whatsoever. If yeah. I were to turn my headlamp off in a dark area, I couldn't see my hands in the front of my face. Yeah. Wow. Um, I did explosives for a while there, um, which was, you know, loading explosives, tying in the explosive lines, and then detonating them. Um, and uh, I am a group leader in the mine as well, which is a foreman, but on the union mm-hmm. side. So I'm a union worker who works as sort of like a company foreman when it's needed. Wow. Wow. Do you like it? Uh, It's okay. It's a job. Um, You know, like most work, you know, it is work. I don't show up there to have fun, but I hope that I can have fun sometimes. Yeah. Um, How many people do you usually work with down there? Like how many people are you working amongst? Anywhere from four to six, probably usually immediately, you know, with me in my yard. Um, a yard is uh, an area of the mine that has a series of working faces based on corridors and uh, what we call cross cuts. So, like, you might be in room 23, cross cut A, mm-hmm. or so on and so forth. It's uh, it's interesting. What are your most of your what are your colleagues mostly like? What are my colleagues mostly like? Yeah, what what are the, what are the, what are the people you work with like, and how do you get along with them, and what do they think of you? <laughs> uh, you know, I get along with my colleagues pretty well. Um, I am definitely the odd man out, uh, and I definitely I think to them. I can be sort of a novelty at times. Uh, Some of them are aware of the things that I do and stuff like that. Um, You know, the people I work with, they're all, they're all hunters. Uh They're all uh, people who love to snowmobile and ride four wheelers and motorcycles. And I'm just kind of the guy that shows up and does his job. And yeah. Um, but we get along. You're, you're not into that kind of stuff. Not really. No. Not. <laughs> I live in the city. They live yeah, in the okay. country. Okay. Okay. Um, I live in Rochester, New York. Um, downtown. Yeah. Yeah. The view out my window is the tops of other buildings. Yeah. Um, and the view out their window is a forest. Sure. Um, so very different, but well, we get along very well. Cool. And I'm good at rolling with the punches. So. Yeah. What made you choose that job? Or what made you go into that job? Um, I didn't really choose it. Um, so I worked in record stores for probably more than a decade. Um, and then uh, I moved to Rochester from Boston. And uh, I got here and I got a call. Saying, hey, you want to work at the mine? <sighs> sure. I said, What's, All like right, a friend or something like that? Or who? Who? Like Tuesday. Uh a uh, a person I knew, their their uh, stepfather. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I was like, sure, why not? I'll do it. And I've been there ever since. I didn't have wow. any interview, I didn't have any experience. I just went in and started at it. Yeah. Do you see yourself staying there for a long time? Um, it's hard to say sometimes. I mean, I've been there a long time. Uh, yeah. Supposedly, they are going to promote me. Mm-hmm. But whether or not that actually occurs right now, it's hard to say. We're having difficulties in the mine. 
if they don't promote me, I'm probably going to start looking for a new job just to, you know, constantly move forward, not stagnate. Yeah. But, but I need to do it carefully. So. Would you continue to look in this sort of field? I mean, like, or would you maybe do something more art oriented or, or, you know, kind of. I most likely would not look in this sort of field. Um, and I told myself a long time ago that I no longer really am willing to partake in freelance artwork. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if a friend or an acquaintance, you know, confronts me and asks me for something, I'll, I'll consider it. I still charge them, but sure. Um, but uh, most likely, I would look to work in another heavy equipment operating job. Yeah. Um, just for pay. It yeah. Pays fairly well. Sure. Um, I actually, I was just asked to do a new piece of artwork for somebody and uh, still need to start work on it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. That's, I mean, heavy machine, I mean, machinery in general is very fascinating. And I think if you're comfortable with it and know how to use it, it can probably be pretty interesting in some ways. Yeah. Really satisfying. It's, it's, it's somehow satisfying, you know? It's wild. Um, the drill is kind of um, boring sometimes, but say like running a loader, um, I mean, it never really gets not interesting because you're always scared you're going to tip the thing or do something crazy. You're driving fast around corners with full buckets of salt. So, What's the sound like? I mean, you've you talked about using some recordings down there. What's, I mean, is that a pretty intense sound experience? Yeah. Um, I'd be hard pressed to describe it in a super effective manner. Um, you know, salt drilling, I might equate to, um, pink noise, uh-huh. uh, as it has like a more rumbly crackle to it. that sort of uh-huh. pops out. Uh, it's a little bit more three dimensional, um, yeah. while running a loader, you're really, it's going to be more of like, a almost like a muffled white noise, mm-hmm. um, where you're going to get the, the strongest noise from say like a loader, um, uh, would be when you pick up the bucket and then slam it to the ground, it'll make a, it's like an earthquake. Wow. You can hear it from a quarter of a mile away. Cool. Yeah, it was one time uh, I was down in that mine in far eastern Poland. Um, yes. The salt I mine. forget what it's called. Yeah, the salt oh, mine, exactly. Oh. I forget what it's called. It's open to tourists now. I mean, we went. I went down, yeah. you know, as a tourist, and, yeah. but it. And it was, it's been used in a ton of films and stuff like that also. I mean, it's, but it's huge and it's insane. I mean, it's really surreal to realize how much space you can carve out underground. I mean, they have a cathedral down there, you know? Yeah, they have a cathedral. Um, It's a beautiful, beautiful spot. Have Um, you been there? I have not. I've been close to it, but not to it, unfortunately. I'm going to make a pilgrimage. I know. I need to make a new uh, a new visit to Europe, but it's so pricey right now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're the salt mine I work in. I mean, the roof is twenty feet tall, and from rib to rib, ribs being like this, you know, yeah. your rib. Um, yeah. you're talking fifty, sixty feet. We drive wow. trucks down there. Um, wow. So it's really huge down there too. It's very large. Open open large um you know on day shift there might be a hundred people down there maybe more wow wow that's incredible but it's large i mean uh, we're talking 16 miles around yeah incredible that's that's insane it's really insane yeah the the one that we were the, the, we were down there and they you know they have all these these places open that are of course you know well lit and cleaned out and everything that for the tourism but they told us at the end i think the the path we walked on which was very large is like one percent of the entire mine 
it's a very old mine. Yeah. And they did different kind of mining than we do now. They did like slab mining where they did multi-level. And in my mind, we do single level. There's no multi-level right now. Okay. The following noise video is brought to you by the White Centipede Noise Maniac Circle. For information on the artist and track, check the description of this episode. I asked people on the uh, the Maniac Circle Discord server, which I have set up for the the podcast, and I invite all you'll get an invite very soon too. I invite all podcast guests to be on there. Um, if there are any questions for you, and one one guy had a question, uh, Vincent, who does a project called Garland from Texas, he asked, in regards to finished songs or albums, do you think intent and process matters more than the result, and why? No, never. If I can't listen to something every day, over and over again, for months, then the result is a failure. 
and it's mm -hmm. no good. It's not worth anyone hearing. I I I have oftentimes intent and 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 a process depending on the project, but if that intent and process fails, and the end result, there's there's no reason to move forward. I need I do this for me. I don't do this for you. I don't do this for Vincent. I don't do this for anybody. If if I make it and I love it, then I'm gonna release it. Mm -hmm. If I make it and I can't listen to it tomorrow, it's not gonna happen. So it doesn't matter what my intent is. If the result isn't right. If it doesn't, if it doesn't show my intent, or mm -hmm. or not even show, but send some idea out there, whether it be mm -hmm. math or not, for you to interpret, if it's mm -hmm. not perfectly there, it was not worth it in the end. It's not mm -hmm. worth really for me. For me, sure. But even if you you know you say you're doing it for yourself and and not the the recipient could it then not be that the process for you is very important and that produces something that you are very satisfied with that maybe is sort of more objectively not known or received but you know you know what it is and it's and it's importance for you do you feel that way ever or is it really just like are you able to kind of hear it from the outside so to speak I start by hearing from the inside. I move forward. I set up my equipment. I have my ideas. They may change. They may not stay the same. That's just the way things are. The only thing we're guaranteed in life is change. Mm -hmm. Nothing else is guaranteed. Um, I sit down and I record the process. I mean, I could come up. I, I mean, I don't know what my process is, but let's say I have some immaculate process and I come out here and I, I've had people ask me if I bloodlet stuff like that. I don't, <laughs> but, okay. but let's say I'm squirting blood all over the sofa of my living room and I'm coming yeah. up with everything I dreamed of. And it yeah. sounds like shit at the end. It's going in the trash. Yeah. You're never going to hear it. Yeah. If right. I don't like it, it's over. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's perfect. What are your top five power electronics, noise, industrial releases of all time? Um, I don't know. <sighs> you hit me with a bomb question there, man. Uh, <laughs> all and time. bonus bonus points if you can if you can like show it to the can camera. Go show it. Some of them? Yeah, yeah. Bonus points if you can flex. Okay, okay, I'll flex. Hold on. All right, all right. <laughs> but what what can you tell us about what that's coming up next from you or packing plant or live shows? Anything like that that. Um, packing plant, there's going to be a release by a group called the Megalotomy, which is myself, mm. Bowman Detox, and Pleasure Fluids, mm. um, as well as a compilation, which will have um, artists who I say everyone is very, very familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not. I'm not going to state who they are. Um, but I would say if you if you didn't know who they were, I would be very very surprised. Sure. Um, I have the Wounded Son LP, which is almost done. Um, cool. I have uh, Wounded Son four times cassette box set, um, which is not anywhere close to being done, as it's going to be four C twenties. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I'm working later today on a comp track for Brett for Total Black for the moving of Sentimental Youth. 
mm. which will be predominantly noise based. Okay. What else? Is there anything else? That's a lot of oh, <laughs> There is one other thing. Um, I cannot disclose too much about it at this moment in time. It has a full vision, but it has two presses. Um, there is a six cassette box coming and a large vinyl oversized clamshell with a lot mm. of inserts and photographs that will document AL, Agonal Lost. Mm. Um, and then after that is gone, there will be a vinyl reissue of that, wow. which will cool. be uh, probably about, well, I guess it was, it's going to have to be six LP. Wow. I'm saying so. Um, that's hard, but the, the labels and the label for the, all of that is already planned out. We, we have plans okay. to follow through with it all. Great. Cool, man. Well, um, anything else you want to add or can, can let us know about anything else we didn't cover that you want to share? No, no, I think uh, we had a nice little conversation here today. Um, Absolutely. I'm not, uh, I'm not an image guy. I don't, I just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you opening up and sharing, you know, all of it from your work to the personal stuff. That's uh, really appreciated. And um, yeah, and I'm, I'm willing to talk further anytime or uh, whatever. And uh, I'll get you what we talked about. Excellent. Then we will um, keep in touch and talk to you soon. Absolutely. Thank you, Oscar. See ya. See ya. In the extended segment of this episode, James talks about his personal relationship with the late, great Keith Brewer of Taint and Mania and shows me his top five industrial and power electronics releases of all time from his collection. James was also gracious enough to donate an exclusive digital EP from Agonal Lust Side Project Contravention to the Maniac Circle, which is now available there for download. You can find all that and much more at patreon.com slash white centipede noise. There are five new tapes out now on white centipede noise from Robert Fuchs, a split between Mott and Murmur, Viper, God Pussy, and Jockuses. At the time that I'm recording this, there are a handful of each title still available in the mail order at whitecentipedenoise.com, and a limited amount are headed out to distros. We'll be landing there very soon, so keep an eye out for those. Of course, the Incapacitance and Savage Gospel Split CD and Size Effects Richter CD are still hot, and the last copies of the recent titles from Kakerlak, Skin Graft, Worth, Maranata, Jason Krumer, and Cam Pipfer are also still in stock at the moment. But don't hesitate to pick those up because they're going to be gone soon. I want to give a big, big thank you to all Patreon supporters of the podcast, past, present, and future. And at this time, I especially want to shout out those who have been supporting from early on since day one in those first couple months before I hit my stride, before I really started focusing on Patreon benefits and bonus content. I'm not going to list you because I don't know if people like that, but you know who you are. You really mean a lot to me, and I won't forget how you believed in what I was doing early on and showed that. Also, a huge thank you to everyone else who's joined on since then. Thank you for paying attention and acknowledging the work that goes into this podcast. It's because of you that I'm able to keep it up, and we'll be able to keep it up into the future. For those of you not supporting yet, head over to patreon.com slash noise now to check out the various levels of support and benefits available for doing so. I'm only doing public episodes of the podcast every other week from now on. So for just five euros a month through Patreon, you can get access to the full weekly schedule, which means new episodes, new content each week. The next level up from that for 10 euros a month is the Maniac Circle. I try to give regular digital downloads related to my guest. And through the Maniac Circle, you have opportunity to be more involved with the podcast, what goes into it, submitting material, submitting content, submitting ideas, asking questions for the guests, and getting behind-the-scenes info on the podcast and the label White Centipede Noise. The next level up from that is for heavy sponsors and noise fiends. If you support the podcast at 25 euros per month, you get everything in the previous tiers. You also get to partake in the physical merch giveaways and occasional gifts. You also get access to a private old school list of incoming distro items and new white centipede noise releases, and you'll have the chance to reserve and pre-order them before they hit the mail order for the general public. All of these things that I offer are my way 
of thanking you for your crucial support of this podcast. I can't do it without your support, so I really appreciate those who recognize that and step up, and I do my best to thank them and make it worth their while. This is all just a rough rundown of what's going on in the Patreon, so head over to patreon.com slash white centipede noise now to check it all out and support this operation. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting. Until next time.